Good morning, everybody, or good evening, if you're our guest or joining us from the, from the United States or elsewhere. Uh, welcome to the uh, latest in series of uh, FCC uh, Zoom, online Zoom events. Uh, we are, we're very happy to have a, a distinguished uh, speaker with us today coming in via Zoom. But uh, before we get to that introduction, I just want to make sure that everybody knows that we've got a series of good events coming up uh, this week and in the future. Uh, tomorrow at 8 p.m. Hong Kong time in the evening, uh, uh, that'll be on Wednesday in the evening at 8 p.m. We'll have the legendary investigative reporter and my former boss, Bob Woodward of the Washington Post. And coming up on Friday morning for another uh, early morning 8 a.m. breakfast talk, we're going to have Dr. Li Shang, who's the founder of the new Bohemia Party here in Hong Kong, which I think will be his first public uh, interview or comment. So please do join us for that to find out what that new Hong Kong political party is all about. And uh, we'll have a series of events coming up over the next few weeks and months. So please do keep an eye on our website, which is fcchk.org. And by the way, I'm Keith Richburg, the president of the FCC here. And I'm here uh, in the capacity today just to introduce our, our speaker and our moderator. And then I'm going to step out of the way and, and, and learn something. <laughs> uh, Evan Osnos. Our speaker today joining us who's staying up late, I guess after dinner to join us, is a staff writer at The New Yorker, uh, although you also might see him on CNN, so you probably know him more as a CNN contributor, and he's also a senior fellow at the Brookings Institution. Uh, he's based in Washington, where he writes about politics and foreign affairs, but many of us, including myself, know him as the China correspondent for The New Yorker from 2008 until 2013, um, which produced his uh, first book, Age of Ambition, Chasing Fortune, Truth, and Faith in the New China, which won the 2014 National Book Award and was a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize. And prior to going to the New Yorker, uh, Evan worked as Beijing bureau chief for the Chicago Tribune, um, where he also was on a team that uh, uh, won, a, won a Pulitzer Prize in 2008. So it seems like every time Evan goes somewhere, he's always up for a Pulitzer Prize. So we can't wait to see what's coming up <laughs> next. And he's going to be interviewed by my friend and, and AFP uh, senior executive and first vice president here of the FCC, uh, Eric Wishart. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Eric. And uh, welcome, Evan. Thank you very much. Go. Thank you, Keith, for the introduction. Welcome, everybody. Thanks for joining mm -hmm. us. Evan, good to see you again. My pleasure. Uh, the last Last yeah. time, four years ago, it was in Skype, now it's in Zoom, so. <laughs> See, we're so moving up in the world. I think we're moving <laughs> in some respects and we're moving down in others very clearly. It's nice to be with you again, Eric, it's fun. Yeah, it's great fun. to see you. Hope, hopefully third time it will be in person. So let's see how it goes. Um, I just wanted to ask you, I mean, four years later, uh, I mean, we spoke just after Donald Trump had uh, taken over at the White House. Um, what kind of America is Joe Biden inheriting four years later? Well, I can tell you that uh, actually that's a, the, the title of the book that I have coming out in the fall is called Wildland, and it is about American <laughs> political culture. I mean, we are <clears throat> in a condition of total, as you can tell, total um, Chaos is a glib way to put it. Actually, what we are in right now, Eric, is a state of kind of radical disrepair politically. And, you know, the, actually this word wildland is a very specific choice because it's a, it's a term that comes out of the firefighting world. It's actually the land that bursts into flame. And in many ways, I came back from China and uh, arrived here in 2013 and discovered this was a place that the, our political culture was in a sense kind of massively overgrown and untended and was it, it you know it sounds convenient now to look back and say Trump was an inevitability but we were heading for uh, some kind of crisis we didn't have a name for it yet but the the combination of the collapsing trust in government, the sheer, I'll call it what it is, the sheer corruption of Washington, which I am now, you know, talking to you from. Um, and we can talk about all of these details, but, uh, and then on top of it, of course, you had the rise of a culture of, uh, of real extremism, particularly on the far right. And uh, as you and I talked about last time, even before Trump was elected, there were clear signs that he had activated something in our political culture, an old gene 
in American politics of, uh, of has to do with racist thinking and domination. And it is now in full fluorescence here. So I'm afraid I wish I could give you, a, I would say, a sunnier description. Uh, now, the positive news, I think it's important to sort of take that heavy load and balance it a bit with what is actually the product of our most recent political moment, which was that Americans, despite the, the earnest attempts by the president, the outgoing president of the United States to actively undermine American democracy, he was thwarted in that effort. And he was thwarted, I'm afraid, by a very fragile set of circumstances, but he was thwarted. And we now, as a result, have somebody who was, after all, the choice of the popular vote. He was the choice of the Electoral College. And he is a person who stands, in effect, as a walking representation in the idea that government need not be uh, as thrillingly dramatic every day as a reality show, but it might just actually be functional, it might be competent, and it might make your life a little bit better. That is essentially where Americans came down in this election, and that's what we're contending with today. Do you miss um, Trump's tweets? Do you, do you miss waking up at six in the morning and looking at his Twitter feed? <laughs> No. And you know, it's funny, actually, Eric, it's a good point to mention because there are some in our profession, friends of mine and, and uh, you know, who are kind of feeling a bit of that hangover, the void that's left by that metabolism that we all developed over the last five years. And I don't miss it at all. I really think it was doing terrible violence to our to our minds. I mean, political minds, because it was acculturating us to uh, this incredibly superficial engagement with politics. So uh, that's a long answer to a short question, but no, I don't miss him in the slightest. Before we talk about Joe Biden, let's talk about Donald Trump. Um, now, I don't think you interviewed him. I think he always avoided you, right? Yeah. At the New Yorker. But your dad, uh, Peter, yeah. uh, edited The Art of the Deal. I mean, uh, can we thank the Osnoses for the Trump presidency? Partly, I mean, <laughs> how does that go down in the family? <laughs> I think that would be it. Would that would be a? a I, I think that would give us a larger role in history than we might deserve. <laughs> but my dad wrote a great piece. If anybody is interested, uh, that ran in the New Yorker about uh, editing Donald Trump. Uh, what was that like? He was an editor at Random House in the late '80s and they got the idea for a, a, a memoir by this figure named Donald Trump, this real estate developer. So my dad went uptown to start to talk about the process. And, you know, I won't give away the, the story except to say that, you know, one of the ways that he realized early on, my father figured out this guy was really not obvious. This is not a huge revelation, but he was not a great a great um, literary mind, but what he was interested in was having something that looked like a substantial book. So my father took a big Russian novel and put the, the dummy cover over the Russian novel and brought it up and said, this is what your book would look like. And Trump could kind of access that idea. Um, but uh, no, if I had, you know, if I'd been a more alert eight-year-old, I would have put in an interview request at that point, but I didn't see it coming. Funny. So in your book, you see, I think you met Biden for the first time in 2014 and you've interviewed yeah. him four times. So, um, I mean, just just on a very simple level, I mean, how would you describe him to people who have not had the opportunity to meet Joe Biden? What's he like as, a, as a, an individual, as a personality? You know what I think is, is hard to see from far away is that he is um, casual in his in his contact and i you know all of us have interviewed people of you know people who are at various points on the sort of decorous august scale of public office and there are some people you know we i've interviewed people who is you know the the mayor of a small town who carries himself like a potentate and then there are other people who are sort of slightly more unprepossessing biden is uh he can't really help himself but wanting to build a kind of social connection with you. I mean, I'll, it's an interesting little detail, but it will resonate with, you know, people like all of us who have done these kinds of interviews. There are two ways that public officials tend to respond to you as a published reporter or an author. They'll either pre sort of pretend that they've read nothing that you've ever written, or they'll try to sort of make it 
clear that they've read it and that they have, you know, they might try to flatter you, seduce you, whatever it is. Um, Barack Obama, and I'm not the first person to point this out, would would never let on that he had read <laughs> that he had read what you've done. And it was quite it's a kind of a power move, actually, and an impressive one, because it's a way of putting you slightly off balance. Uh, Michael Lewis, I think, has written about that. Um, whereas Joe Biden doesn't do that. Biden kind of comes in and sort of immediately will start talking about what he's read that you might have written or what he is. He will sort of acknowledge what he doesn't know, which is kind of interesting. He'll start. He sort of has to remind himself to go back to what the what the plan was, what the talking points were. So as a reporter, I have to tell you, that is uh, when I moved here and started encountering that from him, I said, I'm gonna, I want to, I want more of that. I want to go back and interview him again because he was not as self-governing and self kind of disciplining as some of the other figures in American politics. And for that reason, he was actually much more rewarding because he would tell you what he was thinking. Uh, and that's why I ended up finding myself going back uh, to talk to him again, even though the vice presidency, let's be honest, is, you know, kind of a non office. Um, but he was involved in a lot of interesting things. And then he was willing to actually say them out loud. Um, I mean, I think they call him Joe bombs, right? When he, he says, I mean, he's notorious for saying the wrong thing. And you quote him as saying about during the campaign, you quote him saying the more he talks, I'm referring to Trump, the better off I am. I mean, do you think being confined to the basement helped his campaign? It certainly did. Look, that's the honest answer. He, he clearly benefited from this form of campaign, which was more uh, tightly managed. There was less sort of moments of improvisation. And it was also, it gave him a chance to be on his own turf. I mean, his own terrain. He was literally able to get, you know, eight hours of sleep every night. He wasn't getting on the plane and flying to three cities in a day. And all of these were helpful. Also, it allowed him to draw this very clear contrast sort of visually and temperamentally between Trump, who was going out and pretending that the COVID epidemic was over and that he didn't have to wear a mask and so on, and Biden, who was being very strict. I mean, I, when I went to go see him at his house over the summer, they were incredibly vigilant, as you would expect, about keeping us on opposite sides of a room from one another. And I, I was wearing, you know, an N95 mask. He was wearing an N95 mask. We were all being incredibly careful. And, um, but yeah, the, the election itself provided some useful constraints. But I will point out one thing, Eric, that is, you know, I mentioned the Joe bombs in the book, and I mentioned how he had this history, as we all know, of kind of saying things that are a bit um, explosive at times. And you see a lot less of that now. And I think that's a function of, of, it's a function of age. And it's also a function that he is less, he's not quite as visibly, almost desperately ambitious than he was 30 years ago. And, you know, that used to drive him into moments of improvisation. And he's less of that now. He is, as you've seen, and probably read elsewhere, you know, he is a person who is more at peace now. He's kind of settled. And you see that in his political uh, body language um, that if you watch this, uh, this town hall the other night, he doesn't do a whole lot. There's not a whole lot of extraneous um, vamping for the audience. He's, he's, he's kind of over that period of his life, which I think is it's to his benefit and it's to ours too, probably. When, I mean, you, 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 you know him, you seem to know him quite well. I mean, when you watch the debate, when he told Trump, I think he told Trump to shut up, and at one point he called Trump a clown. What, how did that strike you? That's that's absolutely a part of who he is. I mean, he has this, he has a piece of him which is, uh, you know, he is in the end still a, a, a kind of a little bit of the sort of kid in the schoolyard who was kicked around a bit as he was bullied as a kid for he had a stutter. And to this day, he can still tell you the names of the kids who bullied him. And he is, there's a through line that runs through his uh, life that I really only came to late in the process of, of, of sort of, you know, the study of Biden over the years that uh, he, is a, he is especially infuriated by the abuse of power. And that can look like a lot of different things. I mean, abuse of power can look like 
um, a man who raises his hand to a woman. I mean, that's one of the things that he was active on in the Senate was violence against women. And that, and he, if you listen to his speeches at the time, he talked about that, that you know, there was, that was an abuse of power in effect. And then the same thing applies politically, that it, one of the things that infuriated him about Trump was that Trump was in effect kind of, you know, preening with the authority of the presidency. And it, and it drove, it drove Biden a little, a little nuts. And that was a moment, obviously, that just kind of where it kind of came out. And I, you know, he kind of was sort of, I think he did more or less match the mood of the audience. Um, but there's always that risk. That was the little piece of him that is a, a, a bit of the kind of, you know, a bit of a rough diamond, as we'd say. I mean, he's not, Barack Obama wouldn't have done that. And, um, and there's also a reason in a sense, that's why Biden is a little bit more at home in, uh, you know, he's kind of at home in that rough and tumble bit of politics. I mean, one of the things that I mentioned in the book, which I find is revealing is actually that he tends to be very blunt with foreign leaders. And, you know, he says things not quite like that, but he says versions of that to foreign leaders. And uh, he said to Vladimir Putin, when the two of them were in a they went in, in 2011, he was in Vladimir Putin's little private office. And he says to Putin, uh, Mr. Prime Minister, this was when Putin was out of the presidency for five minutes. He said, Mr. Prime Minister, I'm looking into your eyes and I don't think you have a soul. And Putin responded, I'm glad we understand one another. <laughs> and I have to say, when, when Biden told me this uh, in an interview, he hadn't talked about that publicly. And I, I checked around, I said to him at the time, I said, that sounds like a movie line or something. And he said, no, absolutely, positively, it happened. And I talked to people who were on the trip and he, they said, yeah, he came out of the office and told us that story. So he does have this tendency to sort of be unusually blunt uh, when he thinks it's appropriate. One thing, and I think it might have been the last interview, I think it was in August. Um, I think he said he wouldn't have run if it hadn't been against Trump. Um, I think that's true. Yeah, I, I do actually. I don't think, well, for one thing, I'm not sure that he would have calculated that he could have won and he wouldn't have gotten into the race if he didn't think he could win. And that, that's actually an underappreciated piece of the rationale. So let's, you know, the, the, his usual stated case for going into the race, as you know, the sort of, you know, the sort of the high minded version of it was he saw the events in Charlottesville he was appalled by it. He realized how much worse Trump was going to be. And I think there's there's real truth in that. He, he did see it. It was so kind of contrary to his whole perception of the arc of American history that he said, this is, it is a sort of intolerable. But there's a piece of it that is a little more calculating, which is he also looked at the field of Democrats who were running against Trump. And he said, I'm not sure that any of them can, can beat him. And that was because of the specific political chemistry that Trump had mobilized this white nationalist uh, core, uh, and then this coalition of others kind of hanging on in one form or another. And Biden looked at the Democrats and he said, we have a lot of progressive voices, a lot of sort of exciting voices, a lot of people who represent pieces of the Democratic, big D Democratic Party coalition, but I don't think any of them are enough. It's gonna be a very close race. And he was the most conservative member of the field, after all. And he was also the one who believed he could win. And there was one piece of data, I think, Eric, that's really important to remember, which is this didn't get a whole lot of attention during the race. But Biden and his advisors believe that the single most important thing to understand about this election was that the majority of American Democrats called themselves conservative or moderate Democrats. They did not call themselves progressives and that most of them are over the age of 55. And so in a way, they look more like Joe Biden. These are Democrats look more like Joe Biden than they do like AOC or you know, like other people in the field. So that was, the, that was his bet. And, uh, and he was right, actually. Um, going back, I mean, to an Elliott campaign, 1988, um, you opened the book with this near-death experience when he had an aneurysm. And you say, uh, I mean, it opens with him lying on his back in a hotel room on the floor. And you say that instant contains the defining pattern of his life, spectacularly fortunate, and at other times almost inconceivably cruel. Can you maybe elaborate a bit on that? I mean, if you think that was a sort of defining moment for him. Yeah. 
Yeah, I, you know, I, I think for people who don't remember that episode or don't know of it, it's quite a remarkable little um, moment in his life. It's the kind of like, you know, it's the kind of moment that in a, in a lot of other biographies would be sort of the most dramatic thing that ever happened to him. It just happens to be that his life is chock full of these. But it was the reason to start the book with it was because it's kind of buried in his political biography. But he did. He woke up one morning uh, on the floor of a hotel room in 1988, in February of 88. And he could not move his legs and he had no idea how he got there. And he had had a catastrophe uh, in his head. He had had two aneurysms that were so grave that when he was finally brought in front of the surgeons, they dragged him off to the hospital, got him to the surgeons and they summoned a priest and delivered last rites because they thought he was so close to the end. And um, the fortunate you know, you, you captured the key phrase there, which is that it was this strange combination in his life of fortune and misfortune. The fortunate part was that just a few months earlier, he'd had the most humiliating thing ever happened to him, which was he had bombed out of the presidential race, uh, having taken the words of Neil Kinnock, you remember, and, you know, it was really, it was not the, it was not the race he ever thought he wanted to run. He had you know, it had kind of ended in, in embarrassment. And he said later, and it took him a long time to kind of come to terms with it, but he said later, he said, look, the reason I bombed out of that race was because I wasn't ready to be president. He said, I was too arrogant, was how he put it. And the doctor, when he's lying there on the hospital bed about to go under the knife, the doctor says to him, you know, you're a very fortunate man. And he says, how in God's name am I a fortunate man? He's thinking, well, he said, well, if you were still in that race, you know, schlepping around New Hampshire in January and February, you'd probably be dead right now. You wouldn't have made it here to this to this operating room. So you're lucky. And Biden, it took seven months to recover from that event. And he finally got back on his feet and got back into the Senate. And the first thing he said when he got back, he gave a speech in which he said, I feel like I've had another chance in life. And it was actually a conversation that I had a few years ago with his friend, Ted Kaufman, uh, who said to me, um, if you ask me who the luckiest person I know is, it's Joe Biden. And if you ask me who the unluckiest person I know is, it's Joe Biden. And it was that comment, honestly, that was the origin of my kind of persistent interest in him, because that combination of experiences is quite rare, actually, in the highest ranks of politics. You usually get the fortune part without the misfortune. And it's the, it's the, it's actually that sort of the juxtaposition of the two that has created his temperament and the thing that I think is sort of politically interesting. I mean, he had that experience, obviously, his wife and his young child was killed in a car crash, and then um, his son died of cancer. So did you discuss these, did you discuss this, these tragedies with him? Yeah, I did. I probably discussed them more than my editors would actually really have sort of wanted me to devote the time to, in a sense, because I think there is a tendency to assume in politics, well, you know, these are being used as kinds of props, you know. Uh, and I, I didn't feel that way. Honestly, I felt in talking to him, there was a visibility of his experience. I mean, he just gets his emotions are very close to the surface. And uh, he will weep at times when you're talking to him about things that have happened to him. I mean, not tears running down his face, but he will be overcome by emotion. And there's a, a degree to which uh, you cannot understand his political philosophy if you don't understand his acquaintance with real suffering and with the ideas that are a part of that. Um, and actually the one that we talk sometimes about, you know, the, the death of his wife and his daughter, Naomi, uh, when he was a young man was in a sense sort of already a part of him by the time he became politically adult. You know, he spent his Senate years having been through that. And in a way it kind of, he sort of digested it. But then there was this other thing and that was the death of Bo Biden in 2015. And it was a moment of such kind of cosmic cruelty. I mean, this person was more than just his son. He was like his closest human being. I mean, they really were, they really were close. And when he died, uh, it just staggered Biden. I mean, it really, 
he was kind of in a fog for a while and there was a he really was not able to run for president that year and it was his political strategist Mike Donilon who looked at him and said you can't do this you're not I thought you could but you can't you're not ready um, and they had data that told them that he they thought he was a stronger candidate than Hillary and that's probably true actually um, against Trump but um, the experience of the death of Bo Biden it was actually it was somebody who worked very closely with with Joe Biden who told me at one point and this turned out to be a really important fact he said, uh, or this person said, look, the death of Bo Biden changed him. It changed, it, it killed off the last bit of arrogance about him. And I, I took that actually as quite a powerful insight because that is how you begin to see this more settled person come to the fore. And that's the person that people ended up electing. I've got a question from uh, Keith Richburg, FCC president, who's he said, Biden, he asked, Biden is only the second Catholic president after JFK. How important is this Catholic faith to Biden? And um, yeah. that will- Thank you for that. Yeah, thanks to feed, Keith for that. I Feed on from, from what we just discussed, yeah. Yeah, it's actually hugely important. I mean, it's it's mm -hmm. he, he's a very unusual person in Washington in the sense that he is a devout liberal. We have very few of those right now. I mean, he is a person who is- he was really raised in the church. I mean, he, he's done his reading there. You know, he can't get through a paragraph without quoting either his parents or, you know, the Psalms or something. And that I, I've been thinking I want to write a little piece called In Defense of Schmaltz, meaning like in defense of those moments when he gets homier than, you know, your average sort of cynical political observer wants to see. The reason why it matters is that when he's doing that, and this is gets to his Catholicism, is that it's he he situates himself and all of us really in this in this larger lineage he believes that you are any of us are a product of everything that's come before you and it's your private tradition and also your public tradition so it's your private tradition in the sense that if you are the you know if you're the if you were raised in the church and those were the lessons that you, that shaped you then you are a walking product of those things. You are also the, you know, you're the son and the grandson. You are the person who is the bearer of all of this history, good and bad. You know, the, in, in a way, Catholicism forms a kind of substructure of his life. And the difference about, the difference between the way he carries himself as a, as a person of faith versus somebody like Mike Pence is that in Biden's case, it's a it's a more private matter. He's actually at odds, as people will know. He's at odds with the Catholic Church, obviously on questions like abortion, uh, on uh, other on other parts of sort of you know doctrine, and yet he's also completely at peace with it. I mean, he has already sort of said, "I am you know I am who I am. I I am a person who is a real believer, but I'm also not going to change what I believe in order to match what the Church wants me to say." Um, and it's put the Catholic Church in the United States into some something of a quandary because they're trying to figure out how do the, how do you both recognize the fact that he is he is clearly the most arguably the most kind of theologically literate president we've had in decades, um, and he's also somebody who is politically at odds with where the bishops are, and they're working their way through that. Family as well. Uh, um, you, you say in the book when Obama was looking for a vice president, I don't know if it was Obama or one of his aides, saw Biden in a family situation. And I think that he kissed Bo. There was a, and, and then they went to Obama and said, hey, this guy could really bring a lot to the ticket. Could you, could you talk about that a bit? Yeah. yeah, I found that a really interesting moment. That was like during 2008, uh, when they were vetting him to be vice president. Mm -hmm. David Axelrod and David Plouffe, the two of them went down to visit Biden down in Delaware. And, you know, they had, they were having, they had lunch together and, and, you know, they were going through the usual kind of political vetting. And it was this little tiny moment, which was completely not part of the, this is the official program that turned out to be really important, which was that when, you know, Joe Biden had his kids over uh, during the lunch, and when when Bo Biden was going away, he, he Joe Biden kissed him, and he said, "I'm going to come by later, and I'm going to see I'm going to see the kids." And 
Axelrod brought that little piece of information. It was just kind of in his mind. And he brought it back to Washington. He was just kind of thinking about it. And he said, there, and he said at the end of this process, he said to, to incoming president-elect Obama at that point, he said, look, there's this other thing here that there's something about this family, he said. I don't know exactly what it is. I can't quite put my finger on it, but it's something important. And I think it's probably something meaningful for us. And what he meant, what he was sort of getting at, I think, which has turned out to become sort of truer over time, was that the, in a sense, the kind of authentic fragility, the frailty of that family, in a sense, the, there's a realness to it. I don't want to, I'm not promoting it. I'm talking about ugly facts like cancer and like addiction. I mean, they have been through quite a bit. And They've, they've done it in public. And I think in some ways that has allowed Biden to meet Americans where we are now. There, you know, there are different kinds of political families and some of them are almost kind of, you know, almost ethereal in how impressive they are. I mean, in, in a ways, you know, I think a lot of us look at the Obamas and we're just sort of dazzled by, by all that they are able to do and achieve and the, and the sort of, you know, sort of extraordinary qualities of that family. And the Bidens are something slightly different. They are, you know, they have had these very public ups and downs. Um, and that's actually where the, you know, look, the country right now is in a state of, in a state where sort of groping for resilience right now. And that's part of what his family creed is, is about resilience. You, you quote, you spoke to Obama uh, for the book. Um, how would you describe Obama's relationship with Biden and, and how Obama sees Biden? Biden. They have a really interesting relationship, partly because neither one of them expected it to be very good, honestly. I mean, they, they were kind of, um, it was a, a strategic matchup. They were put together partly because each one had something the other one didn't really have. Biden was had some foreign affairs experience. He was comfortable on Capitol Hill. Then President or sort of the candidate Obama didn't particularly like being on Capitol Hill, even though he was a U.S. Senator, and he didn't have much foreign experience. And then let's state the obvious: it was also, a, 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 in a sense, a kind of political move to try to connect Barack Obama to white voters in the Midwest. So that was the uh, that was the rationale for this pairing, and then they turned out to actually really um, draw something from, from each other. And uh, there, is, there is a moment I, I mentioned in the book when they were having lunch after they'd been in the job for a while, they used to have these weekly lunches. And President Obama says to Biden, he says, you know, Joe, I'm, honestly, I'm sort of surprised, you know, uh, we're actually becoming friends. And Biden responded, you're effing surprised. So there was an element in which neither one really assumed this was going on. And the reason why it worked, Eric, the reason why I think this turned out to be more productive than they thought was, as one of his aides put it to me, one of President Obama's aides put it to me, um, each one thought that the other, each one thought he was the mentor to the other. And that was the crucial dynamic. I spoke to President Obama twice uh, about Biden over the years, two interviews. And in each one, there was a real sense that uh, he respected his political instincts more than he thought he would. That's that's kind of one of the things that comes to the surface, I think. And Biden, he moved into the White House. He got, he got an office in the, the White House. How do you think, I mean, he was a very active vice president. How do you think it will go with President, uh, Vice President Harris. How do you th how do you see that dynamic between? Well, between them? I, it, what's interesting about it is um, that they bring very different attributes to the job. In the sense that, in a way, I mentioned a moment ago, what Biden was sort of tasked with bringing was very specific. He was supposed to be a liaison to the Congress, and he was supposed to be able to go around and chat up foreign leaders who we'd known for decades. And uh, Vice President Harris brings a very different set of attributes, but in its own way is, is even more vital to what this presidency needs to succeed, which is, you know, I'm gonna break news, but Joe, Joe Biden is a 78 year old white guy in a country that is rapidly becoming 
something very different than that. And he knows that he, he sort of knows the risks that he will be out of touch. And I mean, there's, there's a communications element to that, which is sort of, you know, projecting outward what the administration is doing, but actually the more important piece of it is bringing viewpoints inward. I mean, bringing them into the highest levels of decision-making, uh, um, you know, the perspective of a woman in the white house of an African-American vice president of an Indian American. Uh, all of these are pieces that are essential if he's going to succeed as a president and if they're going to succeed as a team. And I think, you know, what what is crucial here is that Biden is unusual for a president in that he actually cares about his vice presidency. Uh, you know, the vice presidency is just a, a much maligned position in Washington. And, and Joe Biden would is, is quite, you know, emphatic. He sort of would joke about that when he was in the job. But he also came to believe that he did it in an important way. And for that reason, he sees he sees real value in it um, now. And I would just add one other little piece of this, which I think is kind of important because it's a window into his mindset, which is that you remember they had a very, you know, combustible encounter on the campaign trail. She was holding him to account for his position in opposition to court ordered busing in the 1970s. And it was, you know, she was, she was really, uh, it was a very confrontational moment during a debate, arguably, you know, did sort of, you know, one of the moments when he was most on defensive as a candidate. And people thought to themselves, okay, well, that's the end of that. There's not going to be a Harris Biden ticket. But actually what, you know, what is the lesson out of that was he sort of sees himself in this very senatorial way that you can have a big fight on one day and then you can actually come together on the next day. And I, I, and, and still make some productive common ground. I think there's a real lesson in there. Okay. We have a question from Neil Carabine. He said, if Biden had run in 2016, do you think he could have beaten Trump? I think, uh, I will tell you that for years, Biden walked around sort of saying in a stage whisper, I could have beaten Trump. Um, <laughs> I think he's actually probably, he's, he might be right about that. Um, I, and the reason why I say that, look, the data at the time was that he was actually performing better than Hillary Clinton was in some of the key battleground states. Uh, places like Pennsylvania, which, as we all know, turned out to be a, just crucial and decisive. Um, and, you know, just today, Eric, I was on the phone with somebody in West Virginia doing an interview uh, about their political attitudes, about people like Donald Trump and Joe Biden. And, um, and you know, this is somebody who was a Trump voter who said to me, look, at the time I would have voted, this is a quote, I would have voted for the devil instead of Hillary Clinton. And so if it meant that Joe Biden was the alternative to Donald Trump, I think it, it, is, it is such a significantly different equation in 2016 than, uh, than what, what voters were contending with, that in those key states, it might have turned the tide. I do think so. I mean, I think this was something that people outside of the United States didn't realize was the depth of sort of animosity or dislike there was for Hillary Clinton. I mean, yeah. And look, I think it's worth mentioning to people, you know, we, you know, Rush Limbaugh just died here and right. you cannot understand the antipathy and the hatred towards Hillary Clinton without understanding it as a phenomenon that was fed and generated and machined and, and, and it was engineered over the course of, you know, almost a generation and Rush Limbaugh was an essential piece of that. Uh, and so, it, you know, it, it was not, it, this was nothing, there was nothing organic about the terrain she was dealing with. It was really a product of years and years of very, very specific um, radicalization. We have a question from Al VS. Uh, he said, what are your thoughts on whether Biden will run in 2024 when he will be nearly 82? Uh, did he run just for one term or is he thinking of two terms? Is this a transitional presidency? Uh, how, what do you think? Well, I will tell you that he, uh, the short answer is I, if I was a betting person, I would say, I don't think he will run. Um, hmm. And uh, simply because he will be at that point, you know, the idea of being in the presidency at the age of 86 seems ambitious. Um, however, 
it's an honest answer when I tell you that he has not made up his mind. And the reason why I say that is, you know, for exactly where we started this conversation, his life has been a series of utterly unpredictable turns. And, you know, I wrote that once at one point, you know, back in like when he announced his candidacy for this presidency, that the fact that he was getting into the race at all was kind of uh, the latest in an unpredictable set of events. I mean, if somebody had told you that he was going to get back into politics after being in retirement for a couple of years, it's not likely. Um, so I, I do hold out the possibility that he might, because of who knows what, but the specific set of conditions might be that he says, I'm going to do this again. But I think the chances of it are, uh, are, are less than 50%. And this is this is, raises a, a, a question about foreign policy because I mean he came out last week and the message was America's back, but I think the Allies are saying, well, America might be back, but the four years time it might not be back. Um, I, do you think he can build confidence in the United States and, and take it back to where it was before, or do you think people are just going to say in four years' time we can get a, a Republican in who's just going to be the maybe a, a, an even more, a smarter or a more dangerous version of Donald Trump. I mean, how, how, how can American allies really trust Biden to, to really reestablish America the way we used to see it? Well, I would say I would be at least as interested in what you and your audience would say today versus what I would say. I will add, I will add though, that I think, um, look, I think it is, more than what one person can do is the fact of it. We are in the condition we're in right now as a country in terms of our credibility around the world, not simply because of the violence Donald Trump did to our image and our credibility, but also because of what has happened under the last uh, 16 months in which the United States has shown itself incapable of meeting a public health crisis. We have shown ourselves to be uh, still in a position when uh, you know, we are supposed to have the gold standard for public health authorities around the world. And instead, we found ourselves flat on our back. And I think that in its own way has done tremendous damage to the United States that is, is, at, is as hard to undo as the kind of, you know, rhetorical assault on our values, on our image, on our, you know, purported image as a kind of confident, welcoming nation. Um, but that being said, I will also tell you that I think two things that I think are relevant. One is it matters what a president says. It really does. And I think having a president who is going to stand up and say over the course of the next few years, here's what the United States believes in. And we know we're not always going to meet those ideals, but we are we are laboring in the direction of them rather than actively you know, fighting against them or pretending that they don't exist or pretending that it's all a cynical charade, which is what, by, what Trump did. Um, that matters. I also think he is going to begin to try to, um, I mean, for one thing, he's going to try to undo the damage that Trump did in terms of the image that the United States poses to people who want to come here. You see him already beginning to talk about refugee and immigration numbers and so on. That's a piece of it. But the, but the part of it that is in sort of the most the longer term issue, I had an interesting breakfast recently with a European ambassador in Washington and I said, I posed this question. I said, are we going to be able to rebuild our image in the eyes of the world? And, you know, the answer was, she said, you know, look, I think you are, uh, you're right to be terrified of the position you're in. But I also, I would not underappreciate there is an element in your, just the kind of something in the air in the United States that is uh, probably more optimistic than it deserves to be. But um, that is just the nature of how the country still functions is this idea that we can reinvent ourselves. We can begin again. You know, if you go back to Thomas Paine, it was one of the ideas about the United States that it is in our hands to begin again. And there's something to that. So the, you know, as much as it's whiplash every four years, it is also the case that anybody who watched that inauguration uh, just a few weeks ago and saw Amanda Gorman the brilliant mm. poet who got there, who got up there and in a, in a way kind of spoke to everything that we want to be again as a country. Uh, the dynamism, the diversity, the, you know, the, the sheer kind of style and power of what she said was, you know, just this moment where a lot of us said, okay, we're not, we're not done yet. You know, we're not done yet. 
Uh, I've got two questions, and I might sort of combine them into one here. One from Richard Ward, and one from Mark Mickelson. Uh, basically, I mean, Mark asked, "Do you think President Biden's ability to form personal connections with allies and adversaries will make a difference dealing with domestic and foreign policy issues?" And Richard asked, "How can Biden reach the white reactionaries, the, the, the sort of extremist yeah. fringe that stormed the Capitol?" I mean. Given his personality, both on the international stage and domestic stage, you think he can trust these divides? I think that his personality will help him with one of those problems and not the other problem. Um, it will help him on in terms of dealing with foreign leaders. That I'm absolutely sure of. I mean, I've seen it in action. I've watched, I've traveled overseas with him before. I've watched the way that he contends with foreign leaders. Somebody actually, a foreign leader said to me at one point when I was reporting on Biden, that when, when, when they're in a room together, at that point it was with President Biden, uh, sorry, President Obama and Vice President Biden, that very often over the course of a meeting, it, the foreign dignitaries would find themselves kind of leaning towards, physically towards Biden because he is more accessible and more approachable and so on. And you know, people had a tremendous amount of respect for, for President Obama. And there was also something slightly forbidding about him uh, to some people uh, because he was sort of, you know, he was so, uh, revered. And Biden has a way of somewhat disarming people. I, you know, just one funny detail that I find is worth keeping in mind. I know I've seen him use this line in multiple places around the world in, you know, uh, I watched him say it in Ukraine, but he says it in Beijing. He said it in Baghdad, which is to people, he says it to political people. He says, if I had hair like yours, I'd be president. And he's been saying it for 30 years and it kills everywhere. Everywhere he says it, it doesn't matter which country you're in. There's not a single political person who doesn't respond to that. And there's something just kind of baked. He has come up with a new line now, I guess. But, you know, that that works. Then there's this other thing that we're talking about, which I think is a really important question, which is, can he reach the, the right, the far right, really the sort of white nationalist reactionary right? And that, I'm afraid, has nothing to do with charm. Uh, that is, you know, he can be the he can be the most charming guy in the world. It's not going to matter. That is a different thing, and that is going to take a combination of, um, I think, you know, the most elegant phrasing for this. The best way to describe the only way he's going to begin to break this problem comes from Reverend William Barber, who is a great civil rights activist here, who said to me, you know. The only way you begin to heal the soul of this country is by healing the body, by which he meant not just COVID, also beginning to get people's wages moving again, beginning to get people into work that is dignifying and stable and reliable and is not putting quite so much hands into the, uh, so much money into the hands of a few. That the, beginning to do that, beginning to show this radicalized, really kind of, you know, what I would describe as a kind of poisoned realm of the American mind, that if you can begin to show that part of people, that part of the country, that actually, we're not giving up on you, we are not abandoning you, we're not going to call you deplorable, even though we might think that the things you believe are absolutely abhorrent, but we are going to try to work for you as much as we work for everybody else. That's how you begin to get them back into a more rational place in politics. It's by performance, actually. Um, and this is another question from Keith, who worked as you did in Beijing for a long time. He said, Evan, you know China very well, and you know the US and Washington. Well, the US looks chaotic and divided, as you said, and China looks strong, united, ambitious. How do you see the US-China competition playing out over the next few years? Uh, is China likely to replace America as the global leader, and I mean, and also from me in your interviews with, with Joe Biden, what, what sense did you get of, of how he views the China relationship? Well, I think as, you know, President Richburg rightly raises, or shall I call him General <laughs> Secretary Richburg, I think this is a and vital- And if I had him like Keith Richburg, I would be the president. <laughs> here, here, wouldn't we all? I think, I think, uh, I think, look, that is like at the core of, that's sort of, you know, if you were trying to describe, frankly, sort of what animates my mind these days, it's those two mm -hmm. things, it's that question, because, you know, I spent sort of half my professional life 
in in China and I spend half of it in in the United States and I sort of go back and forth to some degree. Uh, you know, it's harder now with with little kids, but it's China is going to be a part of my life forever. And trying to figure out how these two are going to deal with each other is kind of my permanent preoccupation. That being said, I think we are in uh, we are in for unbelievably tough times ahead. And that's actually uh, rational in the sense that the United States and China, neither one has really come up with, um, it, neither one really has a coherent, sustainable framework for how to deal with the other yet. We have not, honestly, and in, 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 I'm telling you this from Washington, you know, it is a live matter about here in Washington, whether or not China is an enemy, an opponent, a competitor, an existential threat. Those are active points of discussion. And as long as that's the case, it's very hard to come up with a policy that is not going to be tacking massively back and forth. The Trump administration chose their view. They said, we're going to treat China as if it was the Cold War again, and we're going to use the same kind of toolbox. Um, and I think it got them not very far. I mean, if you look at it, you know, China's relationship has collapsed with the United States and also with Australia and with others. So it's not just a unique American situation, um, but the it was not in the end, it was always, you know, to borrow a cliche in, in sort of commentary circles, people say that the Trump administration had an attitude, but not a policy. And I think there's truth to that. What's interesting though about Biden's view of the US-China relationship is he is, entirely happy to borrow some of the leverage left over by the Trump administration in order to be able to engage in a more, you know, he'll then per, sort of pursue a, a, a more um, robust kind of thought out approach. Uh, but you can be sure he's not going to roll away tariffs before he has to. He's going to use every bit of this for leverage. And we're at the beginning of that process. I do think that, um, you know, in a way to, you know, to Keith's question, and I think Keith knows the answer, he's kind of, you know, poking a little bit at this. It is not as simple a matter as saying Beijing is unified and coherent, and therefore they're going to be able to march ahead in the 21st century, and the United States is disorganized and chaotic. You know, I could argue with equal ferocity that the chaos and internal divisions and unresolved ideological problems in both Beijing and Washington are gonna bedevil them. And that's actually why I end up believing, and I think this is really true, that it's we have to widen the aperture, that what we're really talking about is a much more multipolar period coming up in which uh, the, it's not a simple matter of just being China or the United States. I mean, other countries have looked at both of us over the course of the last few years and frankly have concluded that neither one of us is a particularly stable and reliable partner. They are not all that comfortable betting on, on a simple choice of one or the other. And, uh, and we have ourselves to blame for that in, in Washington and Beijing, I think. And what about the Biden administration's um, attitude and how are they gonna deal with the Hong Kong question? I, I think one thing is that one of the areas in which the Biden administration is more um, is kind of uh, quite clear minded is that they believe fairly adamantly that the United States needs to become again uh, an advocate for democracy around the world. State all the obvious caveats. They know that we are hypocritical in that regard, particularly now coming off of a period in which we have undermined rule of law, free elections, uh, and so on. However, uh, we are still a country that is, aspires to those ideas and, and seeks to represent them in our diplomacy. And I think that means that they're going to be certainly more, uh, they're going to be fairly, uh, they're going to be fairly committed to their belief that at a minimum, China should be standing up for the principles enshrined in its own constitution, uh, mm -hmm. which includes things like freedom of assembly and freedom of speech. And I can give you a long list of reasons why obviously they do not fulfill those commitments, but those are the commitments China's made on paper. Let's begin with those. Uh, and then start talking about the commitments China has made to the international community and elsewhere. Uh, so um, look, I think the Trump administration was always a very 
in a way, it was a kind of fragile hope for some people abroad who looked at it and thought, well, maybe Trump is going to be the person who stands up to Beijing on our behalf. And the truth was, Donald Trump, had, he never had any core commitments about about free societies or open societies or the value of democracy. The, those concepts were foreign to him from the beginning. And, um, but, you know, Biden almost one, I think Biden, you know, he, he gets criticism for the fact that people say, well, you're living in another period when you think that the United States can go around the world and talk about its own democratic values. But he believes, and I think more, you know, most as importantly, some of the people around him, very senior people, believe that that's important. That's actually worth doing. It's important for America's credibility and it makes the world perhaps um, a bit of a freer place. So I think you're gonna see him doing that. I mean, you know that during the Hong Kong protests, a lot of people were saw Trump as a, as a, as a savior and, um, and they had American flags at the protests. So, um, and of course, as you know, also China rejects any, interference as they call it in, in Hong Kong affairs they always say this is internal so keep, keep your nose out so we'll be interested to see how that goes uh, and the other thing and and also I mean we're, we've only got a few minutes left when we spoke last time I mean Trump was in full fake news mode at the time I mean <clears throat> fake news is a had become an epithet for him to attack the press and as we have we've seen over the last four years he's encouraged a lot of authority and authoritarian leaders to attack the press. So, so how do you see the Biden administration's relationship with the press? And, and I mean, there's been talk of Biden appointing some kind of a press freedom czar. And, uh, how, how do you see that going forward? I, I, I wouldn't be shocked if there is a press freedom czar. I actually think his relationship with the press is going to be, dare I say it, normal, which is right. to say it's probably going to be frustrating. It's there. We're going to be wanting things they're not going to give us. We're going to be frustrated with the formality and the rigidity of the rituals of the press briefing and so on. But it is going to be rooted in a basic belief that there's a reason why the press is mentioned in the Bill of Rights. I mean, it is, it's there, it's, there are not all that many private industries that are mentioned at the core enumeration of American values. And the press is one of them. And there's a reason why. And I think, you know, Biden has his frustrations with the press. He certainly was of the view during the campaign that the, you know, the press never gave him, they never thought he was going to win. I mean, he was kind of getting, he was roundly sort of lampooned more or less in the first half of the campaign. And so he doesn't have a whole lot of really thick relationships with reporters. That's not really it. Um, but he believes in the basic commerce of ideas as a piece of normal politics. So, um, and I think around the world, what you're likely to see is he's just, you know, I can tell you this with total certainty, he's not going to go into a place and do the thing that Donald Trump would do, which is that he would sort of borrow the habits of the authoritarian and say, oh, we're not going to have questions or we're not going to do this. That's not you know, it, to the frustration of some foreign leaders, Biden is going to say, no, no. You know, I actually have talked to Biden about his time with Xi Jinping. And one of the things that he mentioned to me was that he said to Xi Jinping, look, you don't understand that if an American president does not get up and speak about democracy with real commitment and sincerity, that they're losing at their own domestic political game. So set aside whether or not you think that we're doing it for your benefit or not. An American president is never not gonna do it. And, I, and he has said it since, the first time he said it to me now, a number of years ago, he has said it since then. It's, it's really a core to how he sees this job. Uh, so I would, I would expect, look, I think if you are, if you are um, a Chinese leader right now, and I think many of us who have, who have done reporting around on these subjects have weighed this question of whether or not they wanted Trump to win another term. The reality is that, you know, Trump was doing quite efficient violence to America's image around the world. That was advancing China's interests. And now they're going to deal with a president who is trying to shore up America's position, shore up its alliances, and uh, is going to say the kinds of things that sometimes drive Chinese leaders crazy. 
But, well, congratulations on your book. <clears throat> Excuse me. And uh, when we finish with our, our talks, we always ask our guests, uh, what books are you reading at the moment? So can you give us some good recommendations, Evan? Yeah, I'll tell you one that's very interesting. <clears throat> uh, it's called The Monarchy of Fear. And it's mm -hmm. by Martha Nussbaum, who is a uh, political philosopher at the University of Chicago. And the reason why I find it really interesting and helpful now is that she's talking about the role of anger and fear in public life and what mm -hmm. it does to us as a political culture. And what are the ways in which we can make it useful and what are the ways in which we are captive to it. And as an American right now, and we're thinking about things like vengeance how angry do we want to stay uh, at the experience of the last four years and how do we properly kind of process this you know um this book has been really helpful for me so thank you again um we'll um we'll look forward when do you think the next book will be out september of this year it's a book i've been working on for a long time so it it's, it, it was, I took a detour from it in order to write about Biden, but now we're approaching the end and uh, it'll, it'll come out uh, this September. Fantastic. Well, I would encourage everybody watching today to, to follow you in the New Yorker on CNN. And um, I think we can extend a, an invitation already to you to come back and talk about the book when it comes out. Okay. Thanks, Derek. I'll look forward and, to it. And It'll hopefully in person, cool. COVID, <laughs> COVID and a few other things. Uh, I like that. Okay. I hope Great. to be there. Too. Yeah. Nice to be with you today. Thanks for the idea. Great. Thanks very much, Evan. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye.